you for this time, for this hour, for allowing us to be in the house of worship just one more time. Thank you, God, for allowing us to be in this service. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place. Thank you for each and every one that's here, those who have tuned in to the live streaming, God. I pray that you will bless our coming together. Our time of rendering unto you, God, what you are so worthy of. That is our praise and worship. So we have come together in this place that we have designated as our place of worship. Bless us now, God, as we come together. As we lift up and praise your holy name. God, meet us now at the point of our needs. As we work through all of the trials, all of the tests, all of the storms. That we may render unto you, God, the praise that you are so worthy of. Bless every household, every family that's represented. Then God, open our eyes to see our ears to hear, our hearts to receive all that you will impart. I decrease now that you will increase. Speak to me as you speak through me unto your people. Harden not our hearts, God, that we may hear from on high. Pray, God, that the words of our mouth, the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus the Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. If while you're standing, you could turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter number five. I just want to read the first three verses. The book of Exodus, chapter number five. Verses 1 through 3. And there you'll find these words. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, the God of the Hebrews has uh, met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Just for a few moments, I want to talk from this subject. The petition for worship. You may be seated. Bill Morris wrote in his book, A Lifestyle of Worship, that far too many Christians believe that worship takes place between 10 and 12. That worship is only when we come to church on Sunday morning. Worship is a lifestyle, which means it requires a change of life, a change of lifestyle for the believer. We have attached or associated too many things for worship. I really wish I had time this morning, but I know we're pressed for time. We have attached too many things and associated too many things 
and call it worship. I'm not talking about you, choir, but I need to use you all as an example. Singing is not worship. And just so we'll know, everyone can sing to some degree. But it is not worship. Worship. And I've said on several occasions that when we offer worship to God, make sure that it's sincere. Singing, just as many other things that we do, are simply vehicles to express our worship for God. But it's not worship. The issue has never been in the performance. The issue to worship has always been a matter of the heart. <laughs> and worship always requires something. Worship never comes without a fight. Look at your text. In most cases, worship is going to require you to petition for it. In other words, you're going to have to make some demands and some decrees with the enemy. Because he's not going to just allow you to freely worship God. In the text, after Moses and Aaron had met with the people, they go to Pharaoh to petition Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go. Because had it been up to Moses and Aaron, they would have just gone back to Egypt, gathered up the children of Israel, and took them off to worship. But that wasn't going to happen. And the reason why most of what we call worship is not worship is because when you have been able to freely worship God, and there has been no fight, you might want to question what it is you are calling worship because it's not freely given unto you to just worship God. Don't you know that if we could freely worship God as we want to, that our lives would not be where they are now? That some of the things we're going through in life we wouldn't be going through right now? If we could freely worship God the way we want to worship God at the times we want to worship God, if it was that simple, if it was that easy, do you think God would have told Moses to go back to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go so that they may worship you? That is an indication to let you know that every time you make a conscious decision to offer worship unto God, the enemy is going to come and throw stumbling blocks. He's going to come and put a storm in front of you because it's not going to be made easy for you. Because what worship does, worship breaks strongholds. Worship breaks the tie that is binding us. Worship sets us free to be liberated to, to praise God without any chains or any bondage holding us without any circumstances, any situation, any trial that we're going through. Worship frees us to freely give unto God what God is so worthy of. Worship frees our mind of all of the things that has been plaguing us all week long. And it brings us to a place where we can totally concentrate 
pray ourselves unto God. Worship frees us. When we don't have a care in the world about anything that's going on around us, what worship does is puts us in the presence of an almighty God. And you got to know what happens when you're in the presence of God. The Bible says, the Bible says that in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. That simply means this here, that when you free yourself up to worship, when you petition the enemy to worship, worship brings you into the presence of God. And every need that you have, everything that you desire, everything that matters to your heart, is presented before God and what God does is he takes all of those things and he begins to bless you that's what true worship does why do you think David says, I was glad when they said unto me, come let us go into the house of worship? Because if I could get to the house of worship, worship is the place where I go to meet God. Worship is the place that I can go and I can be myself. Worship is the place where I can just let my hair hang down. Worship is the place I can get ugly with God. I ain't got to concern myself about what people are saying. I ain't got to concern myself about what people say. Worship takes me out of the frame of mind that causes me to focus on people and it puts me and God on my mind in every thought. But worship does not come freely. You are going to have to petition God, in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan, it came to the point where God, where Jesus had to tell Satan, get thee behind me. You got to begin to speak to the enemy. And tell the enemy, get thee behind me. You're not going to have my children. You're not going to disrupt my home. You're no longer going to be able to come in and do the things that you've been getting away with. You're going to have to petition the enemy and let him know that my worship is for God. The petition here is an appealing to authority with respect to a particular cause. It is a request to do something that has need to be done. It is something that was being petitioned for, the something that was being petitioned for was to be set free, to be let go in order to go and worship. And after meeting with the Israelites and informing them of their commission, Moses and Aaron met with Pharaoh. And they petitioned him to let the Israelites go to worship in the wilderness. The first thing you have to notice in your petition is recognize the divine in the petition. Who are you petitioning for? Who is the petition for? Moses and Aaron goes to Pharaoh. And in their petition, they acknowledge the divine in the petition. They say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord God of Israel. They let him know that it is God himself with the Egyptian deities and could not deny the possibility of the Hebrew leaders holding communications with their God. Therefore, there was no need to tell Pharaoh that they said to let the people go. 
There was no need to tell him that somebody told us to tell you to let the people go. They said to Pharaoh that God himself told us to tell you to let his people go. Moses and Aaron let Pharaoh know that it was their God that wanted them to worship. And God has been since the beginning of time always asking for his people, his children, to worship him. The battle in heaven was about worship. Who would receive the worship? Who would get the glory and the praise. The whole battle with Satan and the angels being kicked out of heaven was because of worship. And if you think that the enemy don't want to steal and take away your worship, you got another thought coming because he understands what worship does. We're still trying to figure it out. But the enemy knows that if he allows you to freely worship God, chains are going to be broken. Communities are going to be changed if he allows you to freely worship God. Worship goes beyond what we do on Sunday morning. Worship transcends beyond these four walls. Worship changes not only a community. Worship changes the entire world. Look at what Jesus and the disciples did. He's not going to just allow you to worship as you want to, the divine in the details. Then there is the details of the petition. The petition which Moses and Aaron made to Pharaoh for the Israelites to be free to worship was a good petition and it was presented well by Moses and Aaron. First, there is the determination for the uh, petition. Let my people go. This statement implies oppression and evil. Everything the enemy does to you to keep you from worship is to oppress you and to present you with evil. You want to wonder why sometimes the people do the things that they do? Because it is designed to oppress your worship. And just as God has no respect to a person, the enemy is no respect to a person. He uses whoever is willing Twice in this first meeting with Pharaoh, Moses and Aaron asked Pharaoh to let the people go to worship. The second time shows their determination. Moses and Aaron did not let the scornful refusal of their first request defeat them, but they repeated the request. You know sometimes how we have to tell our children things more than once? Sometimes you got to let the enemy know that I'm determined to get what I'm asking for. Moses and Aaron repeated the request. This determination will be necessary if they are going to have victory, for they will be refused again. That's why you can't give up on prayer. Just because you prayed and it have not happened, don't throw in the towel. It don't always happen the first time we go. Folk don't leave us alone just because we are believers of Christ. Folk don't leave us alone just because we go to church. Folk don't leave us alone just because we're nice to them. We must be steadfast, determined, and dedicated in the Lord's work or we will be sadly disappointed. The determination, but then the directive in the petition. 
They say, we, we must go and hold a feast. God has called us to do so. This petition to go and worship was not unreasonable. The idea of worshiping was very acceptable in Egypt at that time. And going to a particular location was very common. It was universally recognized among the heathen that their gods could not be worshipped in just any place, but only in an acceptable place. So the petition by Moses and Aaron was not unreasonable to Pharaoh. The feast here means that the worship was to be a joyous occasion and not a sorrowful one. It speaks of the joy of redemption, of release from the bondage of sin. Even though we fight for worship, worship must be joyous. It must be a joyous experience when we worship because attached to worship is redemption and attached to worship is our release from the bondage of sin. That there are no more chains that's binding me. That I can freely come now to the altar and offer God my worship. I no longer have to wait for the priest to go and make worship and sacrifice for me. I now can come to the Lord for myself and offer up worship unto God. Even though I fall short, even though I mess up, God has made provision for me to come to the altar and to worship him for myself. I told you, you can't tell it like I can tell it. You can't do it like I can do it. Nobody knows but me. Nobody knows all the pain that I've been through nobody knows the tears I've shed you can't tell God like I can because I can freely come now and worship God for myself my worship is no longer dependent upon anyone else petitioning God for me And that's important because man will write you off in a heartbeat. Man ain't going to tarry long with you. Man is not going to be long-suffering towards you. When you mess up with man, man going to kick you to the curb. And if that happens, who going to petition God for you? Understand something that when the priest went to offer sacrifice for the people, first of all, they had to sacrifice for themselves because they were only human and because they still sinned themselves. And if they wasn't right when they went into the holies of holy before God, they had a, twi a, 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 a rope wrapped around them and so when they was not right with God they would be struck down and they would have to drag them back out your worship when you come to the altar must be for real you can't play with God when you come to the world altar to worship God it must be for real we have a great privilege we have a great privilege of being able to go to God now for ourselves. It's a great privilege. And so the directive, they said we, that we may go hold a feast unto the Lord. You have to direct the enemy in what you are petitioning him for. Because he's not going to tell you your reason for coming. In most cases, he already knows why you're there. But you got to give him directive and let him know what I'm going to do and who I'm going to do it for. And even though you give directives, that still may be a denial in the petition. Pharaoh says to Moses and Aaron, who is God? I don't know who he is. 
and I ain't letting the people go. God is your God. The believer can care less about that. Pharaoh said, I don't know who God is. Who is the Lord? That I should obey his voice to let Israel go. The word Lord must be translated Jehovah or Yahweh to get the lesson here. Because other gods, small g, were known as lords, but with small l. They don't get the big l. But the word Lord with capital L, here is a translation of the Greek tetragrammaton that is the name of Israel's God, Jehovah. Only one gets that distinction. And Pharaoh did not know Israel God. And since he does not know their God, he's not going to obey Moses and Aaron. There are two significant parts to this confession of ignorance. They are the who and the do parts. His first response was, who art thou? Before I can respond to you, who, who, who are you? And he said, the Lord, whom thou persecuted. It's in Acts chapter 9. His next response, what do you want me to do? That, that's the questions that you ask when, when, when you know the Lord. When you know who he is, the next question you ask, what do you want me to do? I don't have to worry, wonder about what God wants me to do because I've already asked the question. And if you ask God what he wants you to do, God will tell you. He will be more than glad to tell you what he wants you to do. He says to Saul, I have chosen you. You are going to suffer great things for me. Don't get scared. We suffer things anyway. Blessed are those who suffer for righteousness. We're going to suffer whether we know the Lord or not. Trials come to everyone. Sinners and believers. Saved and unsaved. Trials. Everybody go through storms. Everybody go through tragedies. We're going to suffer anyway. But you want to make your suffering count for something. Who and do Christian Christ returns in flaming fire vengeance on them that know not God, the who part, and obey not the gospel, the do part? He was ignorant in his denial. And those who have not accepted Christ are acting in ignorance. Because earth declares the glory of God. And you can look around and see throughout creation that even though I don't personally know who he is, he's got to be for real. Anyone that can cause things to continue to happen the way they're happening, he got to be God. And so our next thing is to find out who this God is for ourselves. Mom and daddy, grandmom and granddaddy did good in instructing us, but you must know who he is for yourself because to not even acknowledge it is to act in ignorance. He acted in ignorance, but then there is the insult and the denial. Pharaoh says to Moses and Aaron, First of all, I don't know who God is. Second of all, why y'all stopping the people from working? Y'all messing up our thing we got going here. I need the folk to get back to work. I already told you, I ain't letting them go. And so let the people get back to work. 
Pharaoh treated Moses and Aaron very disrespectfully. But Moses and Aaron spoke respectfully to Pharaoh. And sometimes, no matter how respectful you are as a person, it does not guarantee that they will be respectful to you. Regardless of how people may respond to you, you do your part. You do what's right and allow God to fight for you. Pharaoh was not Moses and Aaron's fight. They were only messengers to go and tell Pharaoh what God had said. But Pharaoh was never Moses and Aaron's fight. And too often we make people our fight. And our fight is not with people. God gave them a message to give Pharaoh. And all they were to do was to go and deliver the message. But not fight with Pharaoh. And I'm closing now. Here it is, the decree in the petition. They say to Pharaoh... The God of the Hebrews has met with us and please let us go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. The sacrifice speaks of two things. First, it speaks of the price of worship. Worship requires sacrifice. A price. If it is going to be good and acceptable with God. And too many church members, however, want a cheap worship experience. Second, it speaks of the person in worship. The sacrifice is all pointed towards the great sacrifice of Christ Jesus. There is no valid worship experience unless it focuses on Jesus Christ. Then there is the separation in the petition. He says, the whole fast unto me in the wilderness a feast the three days journey in the desert was to be a feast unto the Lord and in order to do so there had to be separation and so Pharaoh tried to convince Moses and Aaron that you could have a feast right here in the land and Pharaoh, again in ignorance, not understanding that Moses and Aaron knew all too well that to hold a feast in the land where the Egyptians were would cause them their life to offer up sacrifice because of their belief in animal life. And so Moses says to Pharaoh, please let us go three days that we may offer sacrifice unto our God. It's a reasonable request. We're not asking for a whole lot. We're just asking to go three days journey that we may offer unto the Lord. Worship can't be experienced in the midst of heathens. Worship can't be experienced 
in the midst of chaos. Worship can't be experienced in the midst of confusion. And worship can't be in the midst of all of the trials and tribulations. But worship must be you by yourself in the presence of your God. And because my worship is for real, <laughs> hear me loud and clear. Because my worship, it is for real. Here I am to worship my God. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You have to take yourself out of everything that's going on around you and put yourself in the presence of God so that you can offer up worship unto God. When we come to service on Sunday morning, it is to praise and worship God corporately. But the reason we don't experience the true worship of God and the true experience of being in the presence of God in our worship service is because there's too many things going on in our worship service. Our mind is wandering in too many places in our worship service. We've come to service with too many baggages and too much bondage to offer up worship unto God. And so therefore we haven't experienced the true worship of God. But I declare to your own this day that if you do as the summit says that when you drive up in the parking lot and when you exit your vehicle and if you have praise on your lips and if you enter his sanctuary with thanksgiving and if you enter into this place with praise and as we're singing the song of Zion and you surrender your all in all unto God you throw up your holy hands and you lift your head up and shout unto God that my worship it is for real that my offering it is for real and so God my all I surrender unto you I give it all unto you I lay it down and show free because my worship it is for real and ain't no devil in hell gonna stop me not because of what God has done for me my worship it is for real. And you got to decree to the... You got to let the enemy know that I'm no longer playing games with you. My worship, it is for real. And when we can leave all of it at the door and we come in here and offer true worship unto God, God's going to do something in this place. God is going to begin to move in this place. If you remember in Acts chapter 16, when they threw Paul and Silas down in the dungeon, and when they got down in the dungeon, the Bible says that Paul and Silas begin to pray, and they begin to sing songs to God. And what God began to do when he heard the praises and worship, the Bible says that God shook the foundation of the entire prison, that even the gods came running and falling down and pulled out their swords to kill themselves. But Paul says, don't worry about it. God's got this in control. When your worship is for real, you can lay it all at the master's feet. And everything that's been pressing you, everything that's been holding you, everything that's been hindering you, everything God's going to release it. You gotta learn how to get your release 
If you want a financial blessing, lay it down at his feet. If you want your children back, lay it down at his feet. If you want a job back, lay it at the master's feet. You got to know how to get your release. Worship releases you from the bondage that has you back. And when we can worship God, when we can send, when we can surrender, not just saying, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him I freely give. When you can sing that and mean that, watch what God does. Your worship has to be for real. They petitioned Pharaoh to go and worship. Three days. Just give us three days. When Pharaoh let the children of Israel go, three days journey, and they offered sacrifice to God, Go to Exodus chapter 14. God says to Moses, the Egyptians whom you saw in Egypt, the Pharaoh who was oppressing my people, because you have offered sacrifice unto me, you are not going to see him anymore. When your worship it's for real. God moves all that stuff out of your way. All those things that was hindering you, all those things that was oppressing you, all those stumbling blocks, God says you're not going to see them anymore. Let your worship be for real.